Well, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, this is really a great evening, afternoon, um, whatever time zone you're in, to really talk about something that we don't normally sometimes address or share or you know, talk about too much in medicine, which is the spirit and the soul and spirituality. So today is really going to be uh, exciting to talk about this and exciting to bring my guest, which is Dr. Vanessa Vellis, and we'll um, share more about her story a little bit. Um, but the reason why we're here is uh, I'm Diana Londoño. I'm a urologist in Los Angeles, and I'm the founder of physiciancoachsupport.com, which is a platform that is free and confidential for any physician. And the goal of this platform is to support physicians uh, with any challenge, any emotion, any problem, anything that you want to talk about confidentially with a peer who's also a certified life coach. And we're there because we know that burnout is real, that burnout affects two thirds of us. And it can be associated with anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts and suicide. And more than 400 physicians per year complete suicide. So there's already a shortage. We want happy, thriving physicians. And we touch a lot of lives. So it's really important to take care of ourselves. So we're going to be touching about this topic about soul, spirituality, psyche, not only for self, but really for also how it deals when we take care of patients. And you don't have to be in psychiatry to really also address it. You can be in urology, you can be an oncologist, you can be a, pedi a pediatrician. At any stage, these things can really be addressed, talked about, or inquired with your patient because it can really affect how they navigate through their illness, how they navigate through stressors. Um, so I think it's important no matter what specialty um, you're in. So um, without further ado, Dr. Velez, she is uh, an amazing fourth year uh, psychiatry resident. And I think it's just amazing that in such early years, she's already so far ahead of most of us in a spiritual journey. And um, right now she's finishing her residency at Hackensack um, Meridian Ocean University a Medical Center. I think I said that all correctly. She trained uh, um, initially for uh, med school at Cornell and then she, uh, undergrad, I'm sorry, Cornell at undergrad, and then Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, where she uh, did her medical training. And again, she is finishing now her training. She is really um, talking about and getting ready to start her own private practice. And she's going to help adults struggling with depression, anxiety, trauma, ecological distress, really find that inner peace we're all seeking, combining modalities such as psychotherapy and medication, but really using a holistic approach with movement, sleep, nutrition, purpose, meaning, creativity, and spirituality. So I think that that is amazing that we are joining all these elements to heal people and to treat people and to bring them to, you know, wellness and um, the joy and the peace that we're all craving. And I really came across her because she wrote this beautiful article. If you have not read it, we'll put it in the show notes, but it's a beautiful article uh, that was just published in Psychiatry Times. It's called An Urgent Invitation to Bring Psyche Back into Psychiatry. And again, we will put in the show notes. And uh, if you have not read it, please read it. It's beautiful. And it really touched me. And I was like, who is this amazing person? I want to get to know her and share you know, all her insight that she had in this, in this article. So thank you so much for being here. I'm excited just to dive into all this. And thank you for bringing so many amazing people that are interested in this topic. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Diana. Thank you for having me and, and having this forum where we can all just share and you're doing amazing work with uh, physician coach support. So thank you. Thank you. Well, tell us a little bit, you know, about you, your story. I mean, we were talking earlier and you showed me something in Spanish and you said something in Spanish and we realized you're Colombian, um, you know, background, your family's from Medellin and, you know, my, my husband's from Medellin. My last name is, is Colombian for my husband, but I'm Mexican. So, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you came across this again, you're light years ahead of most of us. And, you know, I'm in my forties, but how did all this start? The spirituality? I mean, was this something recent? Was this something you could grow up with? Was this something you found while you were going through your residency training? How did this all come about? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah. So my family is from Colombia, and 
I was born in upstate New York, so I, I kind of grew up in the woods. <laughs> I was like climbing trees, uh, being by water, and I just really found solace in nature, um, just this feeling like everything's just okay in the world. And I think as a young, like, yeah, pretty young, I always wondered, I was very curious about what is the meaning of life? What is this all about? <laughs> sort of like already like an existential crisis of sorts. <laughs> Um, but it was really in, in college, uh, when I started to learn about yoga, mindfulness, meditation, and then after college, I moved to LA and I was just in so much more nature. Um, and then I was able to do some backpacking, solo backpacking trips in Southeast Asia, um, in Costa Rica. I also, had the opportunity to go to India, visit some temples, ashrams. I walked the Camino from France to Spain, a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. It was about 500 miles or so. So just basically a quest to like look for, search for the answer of life and and to find myself, I suppose. Yeah. That that's amazing. I mean, you kind of are so nonchalant about it, but that that's such a beautiful journey. And I do agree, it's like that existential crisis or questions and which are spiritual questions you know what is the meaning of life like who am I what's my purpose you know why am I here and you know combining that with you know the sort of healing powers of being in nature I mean anytime we are in nature we are hiking we're at the beach we're by the ocean we always feel that sense of calm we don't have that stressors that are running in everyday life you know maybe when you're in LA traffic so you know going into nature you know, and just realize that so early on, you know, again, it's, it's really remarkable. You really are an old soul that is bringing so much wisdom to us. And so you obviously traveled a lot all over the world to these magical places in India and Costa Rica and just really powerful, energetic places. And you started to, you know, really kind of dive into these questions. And I mean, did you have, because it is really a practice, you know, when did you sort of start a spiritual practice? Did you, you mentioned yoga, um, but was there a meditation practice or any other practices you were doing as you were trying to find these questions of, you know, the, the purpose of life or meaning of life? You know, when did all this stuff sort of develop more for you? Yeah, um, well, I, yeah, I was, I was sort of dabbling, trying to look into different religions and spiritualities and um, but it was really when I went to India, I went to, um, I was fortunate to go to Sadhguru's ashram. Um, it's in Tamil Nadu and I learned the specific meditation. And so I was doing it every single day. And, uh, you know, it's definitely not a perfect practice during COVID. It kind of got wonky. Um, but I've been meditating, even if I don't do that particular meditation, I've been meditating every single day. Um, since I went to India and that was in med school in my, my third, fourth year. So, um, yeah, it, it just, I, I try to think about it as I'm doing it imperfectly. <laughs> I have an intention there and it could be either, you know, when I wake up in the morning, just putting my hands on my heart and just like, just being with myself and giving my heart a little hug <laughs> or, um, I like to do that. And then I also like to sit on my cushion, um, but I, I also try to think of spirituality as, um, as, and, and it being like a daily lived experience. So, you know, going to the beach or when I go into the hospital, like asking to be a guide or, you know, a channel of peace and love. So I, I'm, I try to bring, make it a bit more practical and ask for guidance throughout the day. So I think maybe that's my practice right now. Yeah. And I mean, if you really, if we go back to the the meaning or the roots of yoga, which means union, you know, yoke to, to unite, and we're really uniting the mind, body, you know, soul, um, you know, everything is, you know, united and it's not just sort of in the Western world, we know those poses or the asanas as they call them when you're doing yoga, but it really means, you know, kind of what you're saying as you go on through your day, you know, how do you bring that spirituality because um, it's not the magic that happens in the mat. What happens is after you get off your mat, after you do those poses, what do you carry yourself through with that sort of inner peace you cultivate or that love or that slowing down the crazy, you know, race in the head that you're having with all these thoughts or stressors? How do you then take that to make it practical? And I just love that, you know, it's not about going to 
to bed or some cave and just sitting there and not really bringing it to everyday life? How does that, you know, manifest or how can you use it? And I love that you're making it practical for people and just explaining that it's not just about what you do in the morning or night or whatever practice, but, you know, how can we use that when you're in the hospital, uh, when you're seeing a patient? And, you know, how can I, you know, be a vessel? Because I mean, physician is a healer and a teacher. So how can we heal? How can we be there for somebody who's scared, who, you know, has a fear? And I think also sometimes for me, when I'm on call, I've been on call since Thursday. So, you know, I don't like call, but I really try to think about, okay, you know, I have a gift. I was trained to do this. And how can I help somebody who's going to be scared? You know, what can I do for them? And really think about it that way and not just, oh, this is terrible. And then just have such a bad mindset about it. So I really try to say, okay, I'm here to help. You know, I can't change the fact that I'm on call, but I want to help them. So again, I, I really just love how you just change your mindset throughout the day and really, um, you know, you see how you can apply your spirituality throughout the day. And that's beautiful. So, I mean, do you think, like, why do you think maybe more physicians or in training, we don't really acknowledge that spiritual side of us. I mean, I know we are taught to ask about, you know, social history or smoking or, you know, where do you live or what's your occupation, but we never truly even ask, you know, your religion, but what is your spirituality or, you know, is that something important for you? And I mean, is that changing perhaps? Maybe you can answer because it was not done when I was training at UCLA. It was not part of things we asked. Is that being incorporated more, the spirituality, or is that something that is still not part of the training or the discussions? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was fortunate to be able to go to a spirituality and medicine conference while I was in um, med school. It was at a, a Sufi eco village in upstate New York. And it was just a really lovely weekend. And we got to talk about these sort of um, practices. Uh, so that was available. And then there is a really great rotation. Uh, I would encourage any uh, any person to let a med student know it's called HART, um, H-E-R-A-T. It stands for Humanism Elective Reflective Transformation, um, and it's I-M for Integrated Medicine. So essentially, um, a bunch of us got together, a bunch of med students, we all got together in the Redwoods, actually, um, in Ben Lomond near Santa Cruz, and we were there for a month, and it was just so lovely. We got to live together and we had um, different healers, different doctors talk to us about integrative medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, um, uh, nutrition, um, massage, yoga, energy medicine, a whole bunch of stuff. So it was very, very neat. And then I was also fortunate to do um, a University of Arizona rotation at Andrew Weil Center, and that was also for a month in Tucson. And we uh, we got to learn about integrative medicine. So there's there are definitely opportunities. They just kind of have to do some Google searching. Um, and fortunately, at our residency, we have um, integrative medicine rotation. So we get to learn from Reiki practitioners, um, registered dietitians. Um, and so I think I think there is there's some movement there, and um, there are a lot of friends here uh, that uh, came to came online and and are going to be watching the recording, um, and they're super interested in, in this sort of stuff. So I think times are are changing. Um, I think though in medicine, you know, we are still taught to sort of ignore ourselves and not include ourselves, and that could even be like, like ignoring our bodily sensations and signals. Like I remember in surgery, like you have to be, you know, you can't have to be standing up all the time and you have to, you, you can't, you know, go to the restroom. You have to ignore your hunger signal. So I think there's definitely, you know, we we're taught to kind of ignore ourselves, but the hope is that we're acknowledging that we are important as well. In I love that. I mean, absolutely. I agree with you hundred percent. I mean, there's a lot of dehumanization and the training. I mean, because we are ignoring that basic needs that we have to pee and sleep and eat. And we just stand there until we, you know, pass out. And that really is dehumanizing because then we learn that our needs don't matter and that we put everybody else 
which would be a patient or anybody else before our own needs. And then that really spills over later. And then you don't become a functional, happy adult attending, you know, when this whole time you really didn't take care of your own things. And if you're tired, if you're hungry, you know, you don't like really show up as your best self. Nobody is. And um, so, so it really has big consequences, but I love that, you know, there's more opportunities for people that are training. There's amazing conferences that you guys can be part of as you're training. And obviously as an attending that people are coming together to talk about this. And also that you guys are really speaking up and saying this, you know, not at my point where in our forties or fifties saying this is important, but really from training and, you know, the example, you could be even for junior residents that this is important and really taking care of ourselves. So I think that it's such a breath of fresh air to know um, that this change is happening, you know, maybe slowly, but it's definitely happening much better than when we were going through training. So I love that. So it sounds like you obviously had a lot of experiences before you even started, you know, your residency, when you traveled and you had really tapped into spirituality and got, gone to India and things like that, you know, but how did you, I mean, kind of choose psychiatry um, as opposed to surgery or something else where maybe we don't sort of talk about these things that, because I think psychiatry and spirituality are similar in some ways in that we can't see some of this, we can't test for things and say, oh, this is the blood test that tells you you have X, Y, and C, or here's your scan that shows you have appendicitis. And in psychiatry, it's sort of so, you know, in a way subjective, you can't see it. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's sort of the same with our spirituality. You can't prove it. You have to have faith that it's there. You may not see it. You may not see that energy or, you know, all these things, the light in your eyes, that's your spirit, your soul. You know, some people say you know, they can see your, your soul in your eyes. You know, how did that sort of merge together with your interest in spirituality and sort of things that we can't see perhaps? Or how did this come together? Yeah, so I actually... um I actually wanted to be a surgeon at first. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to do Doctors Without Borders and I saw my first surgery in, in high school and I was just like, oh my God, this is super cool. Um, I just love the idea that on the outside, we might look different, but for the most part, we we, we have a beating heart <laughs> or not beating heart um, and, and lungs and organs and such. Um, but it was really in my third year where I discovered psychiatry and I was just like, wow, this is really, this is really fascinating. Um, psychosis mania was really interesting to me it's not fun for the patient at all but it was just like really interesting to see like to question what is reality like you know um what whether people are seeing or hearing things like what what truly is reality and then I found myself really interested in that moment when I spoke with a patient it was just you know one one-on-one -on -one and time just sort of slows down and it's almost like this bubble of like healing or love or or just connection and it was just so it's just it's so cool um and yeah just getting to hear people's stories and I'm I I yeah I'm naturally curious I just I love asking questions so it's just a natural fit and um I probably am more attracted to the abstract versus the concrete like I like the painting in the back, which is your beautiful painting, by the yes, way. You're yeah. also an amazing artist and you paint. So we'll put the link to your website and all your art. So please, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just want to make yeah. a point of your abstract painting, which is absolutely beautiful. And uh, just point that out too, as well, how you merge the abstract in painting, but also in the things that, you know, in psychiatry is a little bit abstract. I agree, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think we're, we're trying to get more movement in tor in towards things that are more concrete you know there's a push with like genetic testing it's really not like you know super helpful at times but um there's definitely something very exciting about being in this frontier and so many different modalities happening right now so yeah i just i just really love connecting with people and and psychiatry lends that um yeah absolutely. i mean i think you're a surgeon for the soul and for the spirit. I mean, that's really what you're doing in psychiatry. I mean, it's it's definitely a different type of surgery, uh, but it's definitely surgery. I mean, you're really diving deep into those wounds and that trauma and really healing in a different way. Um, and it's, I, I find it, 
you know, just as invasive <laughs> as surgery. I mean, uh, surgery can be very physically invasive. Yes, we're cutting through the skin, we're getting to the tissues, we're seeing in the inside, we're all the same. But I think we can really say that for psychiatry as well. You're going very deep and very invasive in something that we are not able to see perhaps and it's not tangible. Um, so I think you are doing surgery just in a different way. So I just love how you had that interest. I think for me, it was actually reverse. I actually really love psych. I did really well in psych. I, you get these letters of distinction at UCLA. That's the only one I got it. It was not in surgery. Uh, but but for me, it was challenging at that point to have sort of the, I understand, like have the boundaries to not taking that energy um, and not taking that anxiety or the depression when you connect with others. And I didn't have those tools then, but I knew because I didn't have the tools, I it was just not a good time for me to, to be there because I didn't have those tools to separate myself. And I was good at it because I can, you know, take in the energy, figure out the nuances. Uh, but, but I really thought surgery kind of fit me. And now I'm really a psycho urologist. I really deal with the psychiatric part of urology and all how it affects us and the stress and how that affects your bladder and all these things. So it's so interesting. You, you know, it's a little bit similar stories in a, in the opposite way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, um, you know, do you think, I mean, obviously it's fascinating. We can't see this. What is reality? We start thinking about these things. Um, how do you think, you know, um, I mean, definitely when there is a psychiatric, you know, diagnosis or illness, or I think even in cancer or when somebody dies, I think that's really a time where many people sort of kind of meet their maker, if you want to say that, or, or sort of find um, some type of spirituality, you know, because when you fall so deep in depression, of course, we want to make sure it's not a medical reason or a medication side effect or all these other things, but it many times could be sort of, and some physicians and psychiatrists also think this way, um, that is really a call for us to pay attention to something that maybe is out of balance, something that maybe um, we need to address for more of a soul level, let's say, and it can really be a spiritual crisis in itself. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that is not really the case? Or what do you think about sort of a diagnosis like depression or anxiety being a little bit of a you know spiritual crisis? Yeah, I appreciate that question. The way I think about it is, you know, there's there's the biological side, there's the psychological side, there's the social spiritual side. So kind of they, they're all connected and sometimes one is stronger than the other. So in the case of maybe a bipolar depression, maybe the biology would be more important in, in that acute, um, you know, treatment. Um, when it's not biological per se, I mean, it, it's, it's all kind of related. We know that depression is an inflammatory <laughs> response, uh, especially to chronic uh, stress. There's also adverse child um events thinking about trauma so it's it's all interconnected I definitely think that there is a type of depression where it's more spiritual in a way um and and depression really is just a cluster of symptoms <laughs> so it's it's sort of important to see okay what's what's actually going on um but I, I definitely think that depression gives us information mm -hmm. on what's off balance so seeing, okay, maybe, maybe it's my job. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's my relationships. Um, maybe it's my connection to myself, to others, purpose, meaning. So I think there's an opportunity there. It's almost, it can serve as a, as a gateway or as a, as a pathway through the pain to the other side. It's not to, I don't mean to like romanticize depression because it's, it's not fun and it's very, it can be very, very serious. Um, and the end point of depression can be suicide. So I, I don't want to take that lightly. And at the same time, it can be an opportunity to see, okay, what, what's actually going on here? And what am I attaching to? Am I attaching to, you know, to my, what, what part of my identity am I attaching to? Whether that be, um, you know, my MD, my DO, my, <laughs> my credentials, um, my job, my work, where do I get value from? I think that's a, it's a helpful question. And, and that question of like, who am I truly? Who am I really? Yeah, that's a great, you know, way to say, and I do agree. We don't want to minimize that, you know, oh, it's just some spiritual crisis and, and things like that. But, but I think that 
you know, many people can go into depression, for example, like you said, when there is that, you know, you were a surgeon and then you were in an accident and now you can't operate. And then you're like, who am I? Who am I without being, without the ability to operate? You know, and people really go into like a depressive state because again, they have attached all their worth, all their value to this role, which is temporary. I mean, if you sort of practice a little bit more spiritual or more Buddhist maybe um, practices, it, they talk about the the things are not, uh, you know, don't think eternal is the soul, but all these roles that we have are temporary and everything's going to change. And when we attach so much of our, you know, ego and our worth to that, and when that's taken away, yes, then we go into this depressive state, into like apathy, like, you know, like there's no meaning in life. And when we lose meaning, we lose hope. Yes, we quickly start spiraling to you know, suicidal thoughts. And it, it is terrible. But then I think it's so important then to sort of start questioning, you know, our bare purpose, our, you know, uh, detaching, letting go, you know, a little more of, of what we put our worth to and, and all these eggs in our one basket and realize, you know, it's not just that diploma or that ability to do surgery. And I see that a lot in surgeons, especially, I mean, maybe in other specialties too, but for some reason I feel in surgery, it's like this huge attachment and maybe because we have bigger egos, I don't know, but, you know, I think the stronger we're tied to our ego, the, the bigger the fall sometimes when that is somehow not there anymore. And I love that, you know, part of how you want to practice is definitely, yes, obviously talking about the, um, you know, all the other factors that can contribute, but you really want to bring you know, movement and obviously talking about this purpose and meaning uh, in the spirituality to your practice. So, I mean, tell me more about like how you kind of want to, obviously, you know, you'll be asking that, but even movement. I mean, I, I really, uh, I like to do like these little dance videos with physicians. And I, for me, movement was very healing. Um, I was, I would like dance with my, uh, um, with my colleagues and the nurses in the operating room during COVID just to really make it a little lighthearted and just really release the stress. Uh, and movement has been shown obviously to help, you know, just as much, you know, uh, with like medication or exercise as some medication for depression. So we know that there's definitely value and a role for that, but tell me how you want to sort of incorporate that or how you got the idea that movement is important in healing some of these, you know, um, things that you see in, in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, oh. oh, sorry. I think sorry. I muted my apologist. Let me see here. I just got echo. So let me, can you unmute? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, gosh, yeah, movement just makes me so happy. <laughs> um, and I love calling it like joyful movement because exercise is it's just such a downer. <laughs> it just feels like so not fun. Um, but movement um, is just, it just, there's like a little bit of more of a joy and a bounce there. Um, but yeah, and movement can look any sort of way. It could be going up the stairs or, or going for a walk. Um, my favorite type of movement is, is dance. And uh, there's uh, a practice called ecstatic dance. And so it kind of brings you into your kind of there's music um that creates the the mood and so it's sort of like stretchy you know you're kind of stretching and then it sort of builds up into like kind of this ecstatic like free movement and then it goes back down and that's been really important in my own personal growth and development <laughs> um there's there's a, a place called Dance Church. Um, it's a, it, up in Ithaca, uh, New York. And then there's the Five Rhythms and all sorts of, of communities just dancing. Um, and during the pandemic, I did a lot of dancing on Zoom, actually. <laughs> so that was really fun. Every Sunday morning, we had we we had ecstatic dance. So um, ideally, it would be super cool to have an ecstatic dance with patients or just people and we could all just dance together um and then just encouraging patients to find something that that sparks joy that they don't hate <laughs> that they actually like and love and you know riding or you know riding my bike is another important thing going swimming being out in nature um but you know a lot of people are into um like Pilates or cardio or all sorts of things. So just finding that, that thing that just, it's really like, it's, it's movement for the mind. 
um also I joined like this thin class um and it's just so fun because you just get you, it's so positive and you get to really like push yourself and so finding something where you're actually doing it for your mind and your soul I think that's a nice focus rather than the body of course the body is important but just doing it more for your mind <laughs> than anything yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's so much in there that I can kind of talk about. Um, it makes me think a lot of my friend, um, Dr. Nirosh Mehta. He's an oncologist, radiation oncologist in Miami, and he founded something called Making Moves Universal. And he actually does this with his patients. I mean, he actually, he's an incredible dancer and um, and he also makes a distinction. He's like, I don't dance, you know, like I move, I make moves. And, you know, everybody can move. It's not about the dance, it's about the moves. So because I think that people, like you said, sort of get a little intimidated, whether you say exercise or dance, like, oh, I don't dance, or like, I'm not a good dancer, but you can move. So it's not about dancing or knowing how to do salsa or all these steps or getting complicated, but it's just about movement and just moving with the rhythm. And you just, when you do that, I mean, you just feel freer and you feel the judgment kind of goes away. But when you say all oh, this dance or this exercise, like people get a little bit intimidated. And I think Alice uh, said here too in the chat, I like that calling exercise joyful movement um, because too many people cringe when you say you need to exercise, but mm -hmm. reframing that, you know, as joyful movement, it just makes it more, you know, attractive. And I agree. And I think that's a big thing that my friend and Raj says, again, it's not about dance, it's about move and sort of releasing that, you know, judgment about it or, oh, I don't know how to do that. And I think it's so important and movement again, or exercise. Um, it really will help you just feel better. And when you move like that sort of depressed and you know, the apathy goes away because, you know, you're kind of getting oxygen in your brain, but it's that form of meditation. When you run that cadence, that step, you're focusing on movement and breathing. And, you know, that's what you do in yoga or that's when you do in Tai Chi or Qigong or any of these, you know, um, different types of practices is you know, bringing that meditation, sort of stopping all those thoughts and focusing on the step in front of you. Or you ever ran in trails, you have to be really careful and really be in the moment because if you step on the rock a little funny, there goes your ankle. So you really have to really sort of do, um, you know, be meditative, pay attention. When you pay attention to the rock in front of you, you're not worrying about what happened in school, blah, 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 because you have to look at the trail. So I do agree that movement, exercise, you know, joyful movement is so important. It gets you in that moment, gets you out of thinking of all this stuff, you know, by yesterday or the future. So I think if you want to do that, you can totally do that. That I think that's a great thing to really make these classes uh, or, you know, reach out to my friend too, what, what he's done or look it up, making moves in the universal for anybody here. Um, it, it really can be done anybody. You could be a radiation oncologist. You could be a psychiatrist. You could be a urologist. You can all incorporate movement to really heal. And again, we did that, you know, during COVID and, you know, my staff loved it. And when I don't do it, they're always asking me like, when are you going to dance? <laughs> when are you going to move again? You know, they, they really like look forward to it on Fridays, um, no matter your age or your capabilities, you know, everybody can move. So, um, so I love that you're going to add that and you know, continue to grow that for, for your patients because I think it's really important. Um, and you also obviously talk about, which I don't see a lot of psychiatrists talk about nutrition <laughs> or, you know, obviously sleep if you're depressed or manic. I mean, your sleep is going to be, you know, too much or too little. Um, but I think it's really important even, not even for those conditions, but for, for everybody to really understand the importance of that and nutrition because what we eat you know, we are our, like our food is our medicine or our, you know, our wellness or our disease, what we eat and how you feel after you have a cheeseburger versus how you have like an apple or, you know, some fruits or vegetables. So I love that you're incorporating that as well. Was that part of your training while you've been training uh, now, or how did you sort of think this is an important thing uh, that many people don't even address? Yeah. Well, <laughs> in terms of training, we don't, necessarily get a whole lot of <laughs> training on nutrition um but there's a lot of a lot more research coming out on um the gut brain access and the you know gut dysbiosis um and the the crossroads between um n neuroimmunology and and 
yeah. So just thinking about all of that connection. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wish we had more training on, on that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I am part of, um, Dr. Alana Miller's um, private practice uh, group um, and psychiatry mentorship. So we we go through um, integrative protocols and nutrition is part of that as well. So um, it's it's a lot of, I guess, seeking out <laughs> of, of formal training. But I will say that there are um, we've had talks from registered dietitians in residency, um, which has been helpful. Um, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I didn't get any of that. And I just think it's so important because it really affects everything. If you're stressed or you're anxious or you're getting triggered or you haven't addressed your traumas from you know childhood, you're going to be an emotional eater. And then that affects everything. And then when you eat and you get overweight and then you get all these other medical problems and even kidney stones, I mean, you get them because of like things you eat or don't eat. Um, and all these stress things that we eat like chips and all these salty things, I mean, they cause kidney stones. So even if, you know, like people think, oh, what does that have to do with it? But it has a lot to do with it. If I don't, for example, as a urologist address the diet and the stress that's causing you to eat that and give some tools or, or, or at least make you aware of why this is important, then, I mean, you sort of miss a mark. I think I can, you can be a surgeon and take out stones all day and, you, and leave it at that, but you have to sort of address, I think a little deeper. And again, it's not just in surgery and it's not just in psychiatry, it's in every specialty that all this stuff is so important. You cannot be a cardiologist and not talk about, you know, the diet um, and, and the sleep and how that affects your heart or the stress, how that affects your heart. Yes, medications are important and, you know, doing a lot of procedures are important as well, but everything else has to be talked about and how that is affecting you. And I think, again, it's really refreshing to know that there's more you know, incorporation of this in, in residency now. And of course, you still have to seek out all this on your own if you're interested. But I think it's it's wonderful that it's being addressed a little bit more. Yeah, it, it's definitely still pretty traditional. And um, there's definitely still a lot of um, difficulties. <laughs> but but I guess, we're, you know, we're moving, we're moving towards a, a nice direction. And something that also helps me think, um, bringing it like into sort of like that soul consciousness or or universal awareness is also thinking about, you know, it sounds kind of um, funny, but, you know, the apple, like it becomes our body, <laughs> like, you know, and thinking about it came from a seed and thinking about the soil, like the health of the soil and, and thinking about the health of the water and the sunshine and thinking about the farmer, you know, um, and all of the the steps to get it to the farmer's market or the grocery store. And I think it's really important to start building that awareness of, you know, our health is really connected to the health of the planet. And it's so important to, to, to really like when we sit with an apple or whatever it may be to be like, oh, wow, like this, I'm eating the sun. <laughs> I'm eating, I'm eating ocean and I'm eating, you know, the water from the ocean, uh, clouds and just thinking about how we're all connected and and how far that apple came to, you know, how far it, it traveled to to get here. So um just building more of that awareness and that connection to the earth. I think that's helpful. Yeah, and that's beautiful. And I'm sitting here on the chat talking about I teach therapeutic breathing techniques and my practice seems to help using the 470 breathing technique. And, you know, there are so many techniques. I mean, I think also this whole notion of like, this is the one that you've got to do. I mean, I, I think like we're so, we're individual, you know, we're very much the same in the inside. Like you said, when you open up in surgery, we all have the same kind of organs, but we're also, you know, very unique. And what resonates for you, what you like, you know, it may be very different. And I, you know, I think we have to be flexible, you know, like if you love 478 and, and even like if you do that 478, maybe later you find another one and you're like, no, I love this one now. And now I want to do, you know, uh, you know, um, six, three, you know, with a pause, like more pranic breathing or whatever you want to do. I mean, there's so many, even if you're the one that practices, realize like you may change and do something less uh, different later that you like more. And that if breathing doesn't resonate for you and that sounds weird, 
fine. But then writing, if writing's for you, then you got to do that to bring down the stress or release the anger or whatever it is, or maybe like painting or maybe, you know, working your car or whatever it is. Everybody's very different. So we can't just give you like a blanket, do this and that's going to work. But you kind of have to do a little scientific experiment, see what resonates for you, what is helpful for you and, and sort of do that. But it's really about, you know, doing something, <laughs> one having the courage um, to, to really put the time and realize that all this, you know, it, it really is a practice. That's why it's called a spiritual practice. And, you know, if you have to kind of do it every day, just like you talked about your meditation, have, you know, you've been doing it since you went to India. And yeah, sometimes life happens too. And then we don't do our routine, but then we just get back on the horse and, you know, give ourselves a little forgiveness. Like, okay, well, I didn't meditate for two days, but I'm going to get back on it and do it. And just sort of giving us that forgiveness that it's okay, you know, things happen, but then the next day you just go back to practicing again, just like if you practice piano, you know, you're going to do your every day, but sometimes you can't do it. Okay. You just do it the next day and every day is doing something. So, um, oh, somebody's saying, I'm embarrassed. What is the four, seven, eight technique? Um, it's just the way that you breathe. And maybe even if Padam, you want to uh, explain it. We can also do that at the end too, but there's just different ways of the inhale, hold it, and then the exhale. So you breathe in for four, you hold it for seven, and you ex exhale for eight. Um, again, there's other many, many, many different ways to do it. Uh, pranic breathing um, that can be helpful to prana means energy. So you can, you know, breathe in for six and then hold for three, exhale for six, hold for three, or you can do seven, one, I mean, either one, and uh, that was going to calm and reset. And what breathing is doing is really stopping the stress cycle and starting that rest and digest or that parasympathetic. So that's what it's really doing is just helping to slow it down and just bring you down a little bit. And when you're not in a stress mode, you're able to like think and, you know, decide what to do and as opposed to when you're like oh, a little squirrel in the middle of the street. So that's why breathing works. Um, and, um, you know, it's not like the only thing to do, but it's just one thing to kind of get you to, to calm down. And if you have little kids, it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, um, so yeah, I really just appreciate, you know, all these, um, you know, things. And I know you talked about it a little bit earlier, what you do for your sort of personal practice, but I, I, I want to see if you want to maybe share a little more of what you do every day um, that can be helpful for others who are maybe thinking, well, I want to maybe start some, you know, spiritual practice and what does that mean for me? Or how do I get into um, learning about tapping into some of these things of like, you know, why am I here or, you know, ego and all this stuff. And how can you kind of start that process for people that maybe are not in that wavelength, but maybe you're interested? Yeah. Um, well, I'll just, I'll preface it with saying that, you know, in medicine where we are very much taught and in our culture, <laughs> we're very much taught, like, once you get into college, you'll be happy. Once you get into med school, once you get into residency, be an attending. And it's just like, it never seems that like that's going to bring happiness, <laughs> you know? And so there's no real mountaintop. I, that's sort of what I'm this is my working conclusion so it's just okay because all of that is just there's so much striving and there's so much ambition and trying and seeking and I think for now it's for me right now it's just like how can I be uncomfortable how can I be comfortable with the uncomfortableness <laughs> and the uncertainty of things which is like incredibly hard and at the same time how can I find joy in today how can I be helpful and I think that's another huge spiritual practice is like how can I be helpful how can I be of service like it's not about me it's not <laughs> I'm not like the center of the universe and having some sort of connection to something larger than ourselves I think that's really important and I first started thinking okay maybe it could be the sun for me because you know, we go around the sun, I the sun doesn't go around me. So just having some sort of, uh, it could be a, a visualization of something larger, it could be just connecting with that inner wisdom, um, or, you know, thinking about your, your most wise 
and and just asking for guidance I think that's really helpful like do you want me to go left do you want me to go right inspire my words what would you like me to, to say right now and so I think that's really important and, and a nice meditation that I do just to build up some awareness is is it's a mi mac macro micro meditation so the micro part is sort of focusing, bringing attention to the physical body, and then choosing our favorite organ, let's say the brain, and then going even closer, uh, you know, let's choose our temporal lobe, and then going in deeper, our neuron, deeper, the, the nucleus, deeper, um, the DNA, the carbon backbone, the carbon itself, the, you know, the atoms, the the protons and neutrons and, and kind of like building that awareness of the scale of things, how tiny things can be. And then just going back all the way up, you know, um, again, to the DNA, to the nucleus, to the neuron, to the temporal lobe, to the brain, to the body. And so building that, that whole awareness and then kind of zooming back out into, okay, I'm in the room, four corners of the room the roof, then zooming out, okay, the town, the state of New Jersey, which are really invisible lines, <laughs> these boundaries um, that were really the land of the Lenape uh, people. So thinking about, you know, the ancestors of this land, um, further out the continent, further out the planet, further out the solar system, further out the, <laughs> the Milky Way, you know, all the way out to the edge of the cosmos and, and just swimming and swirling in that awareness and just noticing like that's where we come from like <laughs> like we're we're that stardust and so I think and of course zooming back out but but thinking about the origins of where we come from like we're we come from the big bang and you know just thinking about the big bang wanting to express itself and wanting to share and 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 get to know itself and so i think it's so important for me at least to remember where i came from and what i'm doing here it's that and and some people will use the word love or god or divinity or whatever word it may be but you know thinking and feeling that we are that expressing and getting to know its itself and so I think it's important to develop our talents our gifts and share it with the world and um kind of get out of that ego or the avatar of Vanessa <laughs> and just spread the message of like love and peace and hope and as cheesy as it sounds but I think that's what we're here and and we're it's so important to remember that the, you know remind each other I, I'm constantly calling friends and I'm like tell me what what's the truth again um and uh yeah, and, and like what Ram Dass said, we're all just walking each other home. I think that's just, it's so beautiful to remember that. And like what Carl Sagan said, we're, we're stardust. And, you know, all of these these um, thought leaders and mystics and, you know, even Albert Einstein, you know, all these people to help us to remember our true nature. So I think that's sort of my my practice and really grounding down into the earth too and and asking and receiving guidance from from the earth. Um, so yeah, that's a huge spiel, but <laughs> I just wanted to add that, that we're, we're, you know, what are, where we are from and, and what we're here to do. No, I love that. And I think getting that perspective, um, really helps. And especially when you're going through anything that is stressing you, because you think you're the only one that's going through that. And then sometimes even when you're having some challenging time, I mean, maybe it's just anything, it could be your marriage. And you can start even sort of thinking, well, could there be anybody in this town <laughs> that is going through it? it? Could be, or in my work, or in your town, and in, in the state, and then in the United States, and then in the country, you know, and then you go even bigger with whatever your problem is that you're facing. And then that sort of perspective also just kind of helps you release that stress and realize that there's other people in the world going through things similarly and that's just you may remind me of when you're doing your meditation you know uh from the macro and the micro but even when you do that when something's challenging it can be very helpful because you realize you're not alone there's you know so many billion people in the world and somebody else may be going through it and that 
that you're going to get through it too. <laughs> and that people, you know, your ancestors have also probably have gone through it, you know, no matter what era, you know, in the 1900s or in the 200s BC, like somebody in their marriage was having some difficulty and, you know, people get through it. And I think that even thinking of that in a way gives you a little hope that things will be okay and that this too shall pass as well and that there's seasons. And um, I think that's important to remember as well. I just, it just sort of made me think of that. Um, you know, I, there's so much we can talk. And I mean, we didn't even start with your art and, or talk too much about your art, um, which I really wanted to dive into, but I want to be respectful of, you know, everybody's time. Um, you know, are there three things maybe as a physician, no matter the specialty that people, you know, are here uh, with, you know, that you want to maybe share that you want them to remember, um, you know, as there are either training or out of training in terms of like spirituality. And I guess you sort of mentioned a lot of them and sort of remembering where we came from and grounding to the earth and that we're all walking home. And I think these are beautiful things that we can all ponder and think about. Um, and especially you do a journaling, you know, really think about these things that are really pretty, again, way past your earthly years in this body um, and are just beautiful that you're reminding us of that. But is there three things that maybe you want to share um, when people go home and maybe think about, you give us a lot to think about and a lot to to really practice and, and, and do, but are there other things that you can think of? Yeah, I think one question for me, which is really helpful is, is again, like, who am I really? Am I this body? Am I my thoughts? Am I my anxieties and stress and worries? Um, and, and kind of getting quiet with ourselves and being, and tapping into something that is small and great at the same time. And um, yeah, just connecting with that quiet inner still voice, I think. And 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 that's really hard <laughs> sometimes, but, but it, it is possible to tap into that. I think that's really important. Who am I? Um, and then to really practice maybe even if we don't relate to the word soul um just just seeing other people as our teachers and seeing other people as possibly souls or something that's larger um and especially in the hospital it's so it's tough to see people really because we we take away their clothes you know they have they're in hospital gowns and they're we don't see them in their natural habitat. So it's hard. It, it, they become an object. So I think sometimes it's helpful for me to imagine them with maybe their street clothes on or um, imagining myself on the other side, right? Like for, for me to be sitting on that hospital bed or across the table or whatever it may be or desk. So I think that's sort of important too, is, is to really appreciate ourselves and, and others. Um, I think again, asking, how can I be helpful? How can I be of service? How can I contribute? How can I help? Uh, I think that's really important. And something that my mom always says is do everything with love. And I think that's just, it's just helpful because the reality is like, it's not all rainbows and sunshine. <laughs> like Sometimes life is sucky and crummy and, you know, I don't necessarily want to like, do the thing, you know, but, but doing it with love and getting out of myself, I think that's really helpful. Um, just be kind and include ourselves because we're, we're important, we're worthy. And we, I, I think medicine is sometimes a perfect mix for a lot of us because we might have inner wounds, wounds uh, of, of not feeling worthy. And so, you know, we put on this white coat and we have the, 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 you know, the title and it feels good, but there's, there's that hole in the soul and, and external things, at least for me, just doesn't seem to really fill that or, or, or help me feel whole. Um, so thinking about how can I heal from the inside out versus the, the outside in, and, and there's going to be an in-between space. I was just reading about Pema, um, Pema Chodra and the, the places that scare us, that there's going to be in-between the, the life that we lived of like looking for that comfort and relieving pain through external things. And then, you know, that more um, enlightened or, or just more in tuned life. And so there's going to be an in-between and in-between is a lot of feelings. <laughs> so I think allowing ourselves to feel it, um, especially with a guide or 
or, you know, a mentor or a coach or a doctor, or a healer, somebody to, to sit with us in that, in that in-between space, I think is really helpful. So essentially, who am I really? Um, how can I be of service and do everything with love and include ourselves? <laughs> Maybe that's four things. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, I mean, I got chills throughout a lot of the stuff you said, but I definitely got chills again. And, you know, when I get chills, it's like, you know, like there's really just magic happening. And I mean, I can't say that enough. You are just such a gift. I just feel so grateful that you know, I found you in the universe and I saw your article and it's, I know it's going to touch so many people, not only that read it, but as more people just really have found you and found your beautiful voice and you share your gift with the world and, and really with so many that really need to really listen and learn from you. Um, you're, you're such a humble soul and person with so much love and you shine, you shine so bright with your beautiful energy. And I am just so, so, so excited uh, for all this that is coming your way that is just gonna be magical. And again, I'm just so grateful yet that you spend your time today sharing so much. And we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours. I really can, but I'm gonna be respectful. And again, um, how can people reach you if they wanna learn more? I know you have a beautiful website, which we will put in the show notes, but just tell them uh, what it is and how they can find you if somebody wants to connect or learn, do some Zoom movement or talk about your paintings or you know anything in between. And I know you're gonna start your private practice in California, is that correct? Yep, it'll be telehealth for uh, California patients. Oh, so. so lucky. Okay, I'm gonna call you. <laughs> um, but yes, how can they find you? Yeah. Um, uh, so my my uh, email is, or my my uh, website is Vanessa Velez v a n e s s a v e l e z m d dot com. I'm also on Instagram. It's Vanessa Velez m d art, and um, you could feel free to Google me as well. And I have a bunch of poems and artwork through um, in house in training, uh, Psychiatric Times, the American Journal of of Psychiatric Residents. So. Um, yeah, so feel free to reach out as well. I'd love to connect. And Diana, thank you so, so much for providing this space for all of us to just just share and gather together. And like, you really are a thought leader in changing medicine. So like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. I mean, we're here. I mean, Physician Co Support was founded because, you know, I've been through burnout twice. And for me, you know, I got into uh, coaching, which is about the thoughts and the feelings and the actions and results. But then I really dove deeper into spirituality when I, my life was a spiritual desert, really. And I really had to do a lot of work and I still do a lot of work um, to really stay in that place of joy and of service and reminding myself of those truths of like, who am I? Because if I cut off my hand, I'm still going to be me. And I remember also very vividly when I was little, people would always say, oh, you beautiful eyes. And people would comment about my eyes. And I'm very grateful. But I always thought when I was little, it's like, well, if I don't have my eyeballs, like, who am I? I mean, I had these thoughts when I was very little, that if I don't have these eyes that are blue in Mexico that stand out, like, who am I? I mean, am I not a beautiful child, the soul kind of thing? Like, I had these thoughts. And I, and I think that if I don't have my eyeballs, I'm still me. I'm still this, hopefully this light, this soul that can bring positive impact. And so when you think about that, like if your organs, whatever your beautiful thing that people like or don't like, is taken away, you're still you. You still have this essence of, of your worthiness, your beauty and what you can contribute. So think about those things, uh, maybe, uh, perhaps. Uh, and again, it was all founded because, you know, we are in a difficult place. We're healers, we're teachers. We want to be at a burnout. We want to change the culture of asking for help, of getting courage to take a step. And you don't have to do coaching. You can do therapy or you can do anything, but to get you out of the place where you're suffering and really remembering those truths of your worthiness. So again, thank you so much for everybody that came. I'm just so, so, so grateful. So many came and um, you know are in the same wavelength of learning and talking about this, which is so important in our lives personally and as physicians. So thank you again. We will have the replay um, at physiciancosupport.com. Thank you so much. I am really, really grateful for all of you. Thank you.